28, I want to look at the, of course, the resurrection passage. So let's begin reading in verse number 1. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 1. The Bible reads, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Verse 6. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. I found it appropriate and fitting for it being Easter and then everything that's going on with current events. This morning I'm going to be preaching on the subject of the freedom of the resurrection. The title of the sermon specifically is The Freedom Found in the Resurrection. Now, of course, freedom has been on your minds a lot. Freedom has been discussed and liberties have been discussed very often over the past couple of weeks. Uh, so when I was studying the resurrection, a lot of things that just kept popping out at me are the truths that lie therein about the freedom found in the resurrection. And that's the title of the sermon this morning. Freedom found in the resurrection. Now, I, w I do want to start with like a, somewhat of a prologue on the subject of things that are going on right now and why this is very applicable. You know, we as United States citizens right now are losing our rights. That is what's happening. And if you think that you are just going to have your rights handed back to you with no consequences, nothing has changed, you are out of your mind. You have something coming to you. So uh, uh, with, with understanding that and knowing that, we have to keep our mind on biblical principles. We have to keep our mind on the Bible. We are not a true citizen of the United States anyways. Yeah, maybe physically and worldly, but my true citizenship lies in heaven. My true citizenship lies in heaven where I have true freedom. And the freedom that I have is found in the resurrection. I want you to go to Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 1. Galatians chapter number 5, verse number 1. I want you to think about the things that are going on uh, in the nation today uh, here as far as an introduction just for a few minutes and I want to I help you to envision something for just a minute because we were born pretty free comparatively to how people have lived in the past. There have been many nations that have had freedom like what we have. People act like it's just the, the rarest thing but that's not necessarily true. There, there is quite a bit of freedom in a lot of nations you know, that have existed in history and, and different citizens and or, I'm sorry cultures and societies which have had quite a bit of freedom. But we as well, I agree, we have, we have quite a bit of freedom still now. And uh, United States of America was a very free country. But you know, if you think about how unsettling it really is today with what's going on, that you yourself as a United States citizen, as a citizen of you know, the state of Florida specifically, you, know, you are subject to whatever executive order comes out next. That's how it works. I want you to think about that. Whatever the governor decides, whatever he decides to pass it, you're subject to the executive orders that he signed so far. And if you do not comply with those, you know, there will be penalties, possibly jail time, fines, whatever it may be. And whatever he decides to sit down at his desk and write up, whatever executive order that that is, and he decides to sit down and, and write up, you will be subject unto those laws as being a United States citizen. Whatever he decides is of his own volition. He has that power in his hands, which he's not, he shouldn't have that power in the way in which it's being treated today. He's violating the Constitution and all that, but that's besides the point right now. So that is how things are operating at this point. And that, when you understand that, that can be a little bit unsettling. That can be a little bit uh, deterring in the sense of, of of when you realize that there is a, a, a layer a layer of subjection there, where we are in subjection to those executive orders and to those laws. Whatever it is, you're going to have to comply with that. 
Now, just understanding that with having the freedoms, you know, taking step number two and realizing of how those freedoms are being stripped, where we are today of, of you know, all of these, you know, uh, unconstitutional executive orders that have been signed. Take another step and kind of envision, uh, you know, how, how slaves have felt. You know, of course, what happened to African Americans, you know, throughout the United States history was terrible and horrible. It was, it was, it was atrocious and it's condemned by the Bible. It's not all right. And there's been slavery that has taken place in all in many countries, let me say. Different forms of slavery. Can you imagine? You were born free and you don't understand that. And just that little bit that we just discussed a moment ago of your freedoms being stripped. Can you imagine taking another step and being born as a slave? Can you imagine taking another step where you have a, per, uh, a, a personal master, a, 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 a slave master, <coughs> excuse me, or you are just a bond servant and, and, and this man, you know, you are in subjection to. Where he tells you what you eat, he tells you where you eat, he tells you when you eat, he tells you where you live, where you sleep, when you sleep, you make no decisions. He decides whether you get married and who you get married to. He decides what work you do and everything that goes on, goes on in your life from point A to point B. Can you imagine living a life of being in bondage and, and, and slavery to that extent? And having zero freedoms in your life. And also, could you imagine, let's say, living you know, a life like that and put yourself into those shoes. But let's say that there was a moment like what happened in the United States of America where you know, there was emancipation, where there was freedom that was given, where there was people you know, that were slaves and then there was a moment where they were set free, where they were given liberty, where they were given true freedom. And the master came, if you will, is, it, it, you know, I'm sure some of them actually did wear chains and they did have fetters and they had you know, different sorts of entrapments that put them into bondage. Can you imagine the moment where you had heard the news and then somebody came to you and there was a literal key and there were literal fetters and that key was stuck into... The, the, the bond or the, the chain, whatever, wherever it was locked, and they turned that key and set you free, and he said, go on your way. And you could just make any decisions you wanted. I mean, you had true freedom to do what you wanted, to go where you wanted, to live how you want, to do whatever you want. I mean, that is an amazing feeling, wouldn't it be, when you put yourselves in those shoes, where you have true freedom. I mean, that's what people experience in the United States of America. I mean, they had a, a, a series of laws and bondage that, and oppression that was going on from, you know, uh, uh, England. And when they won the battle, I mean, they had freedom to go wherever, to build whatever, to live wherever, to run a business, to do whatever they want. I mean, the feeling of freedom is a good thing. It truly is. And that is what is found in the resurrection. You think about, hey, the gospel is, is great. There's power in the, in the gospel. Of course, we know that. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 tells us that there is power in the gospel. When you study, though, <coughs> the gospel, where all of the power lies is ultimately in the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear that without the resurrection, we have no hope. Where the power actually is, is in the resurrection. And let me tell you this, you may or may not have understood this, but the reason why the resurrection is so great, and the reason why, let's take a step back and say even this, the reason why the gospel is so great, the reason why the message of Jesus Christ and the message of salvation is so great is because it brings freedom. Amen. That is the true, real reason why. Amen. It's because it brings freedom. Now, you're in Galatians chapter number 5. I'm going to read to you from a few passages here. I want you to, I want you to think about this concept here uh, of, uh, of, you know, slavery and all of that. And oftentimes, a burden is likened unto a yoke. And a yoke is, is oftentimes bondage. That's what it is. Uh, you, uh, <coughs> you may have heard this before, but... Um, the majority of, of, of the people that I've ever said, hey, describe to me how it felt at the moment of salvation. And the majority of people that I've heard, I've heard many a testimony where people stand up and they say, hey, the moment of my salvation felt like this. And I would guarantee that you felt the exact same way. And this is how it's described. I felt like a burden was lifted off my shoulders. At the moment of salvation, you just feel this massive relief. 
You feel this massive, this moment of just, uh, of just a burden being lifted off your shoulders. Amen. My dad described it to me like that. I mean, and when he did, and the reason why it sticks out to me, I remember when he was describing his moment of salvation. I had never put my moment of salvation really into words in my mind. You know, I, I knew the feeling. It was somewhat abstract, but I never really put a term on it. And then when he said that, I was like, that's exactly how I felt. And I've heard people since, and I'm more sensitive to it now, where people will describe that moment and they all say the same thing. It feels like a burden is lifted off their shoulders. They have this moment of relief. You know what it is? Is It's the feeling of freedom. A burden in the Bible is, is, is something that is likened unto work. It's something that is likened unto wages. And it's also coupled with a yoke. And a yoke is very often likened unto work and wages, but it's also very often likened unto bondage. Uh, I want to show you this parallel with a yoke and burden. Isaiah 9, 4 says, For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden. Isaiah 10, 27 says, And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. Sound familiar? A burden was lifted off my shoulders. The yoke was taken off of him. Isaiah 14, 25, Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. Notice this over and over again. Then Jesus said in Matthew 11.30, For my yoke <coughs> is easy and my burden is light. This yoke and this burden that it's talking about is talking about oppression. It's talking about labor that is being forced and work that is being forced on you. It's talking about bondage and slavery. It's talking about a lack of freedom and a lack of liberty. Isaiah 58.6 says the heavy burdens... And to let the oppressed go free. Notice that. The heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke. That's how people describe their salvation. You know how they're describing it? They feel like they've been let free. They feel like they have a moment of relief because they now feel like they've been given freedom. They have a moment of liberty because their burdens have been lifted. Now we oftentimes will sing the song, you know, my burdens were lifted at Calvary. And I understand why we, we would word it that way and it's partially true, but <coughs> in a very technical sense it's not true. Because the burden is lifted at the resurrection because that is where the power lies. That is where death was defeated and that is where we are given liberty and we are freed from the bars of sin and from death. That is. So you are in Galatians chapter number 5. I want to go ahead and read Galatians chapter number 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter number 5. We can see this being taught with the yoke. Galatians chapter number 5 verse number 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Notice that. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. What is a yoke here? It's bondage. What is a yoke we read in Isaiah? It's a burden. And what did he say? He said, stand fast therefore in the liberty, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter number 2. Now, <clears throat> this morning I'm preaching an Easter centered or, or uh, Easter, uh, you know, uh, uh, themed sermon about the resurrection that is. You know, but it's going to be a doctrinal sermon. I want you to learn something and, you know... Uh, it resonated with me much more so than usual when I really started studying this subject and it really hit me that the main reason, the number one reason of why the resurrection is so great is because of the freedom. It's because of the liberty that you are given. So this morning I'm not going to just be preaching just, you know, just a cute sermon just so that I can preach something about Easter and about the resurrection, I want to teach you doctrine. I want you to understand, and it's a great subject because it's a great feeling when you truly understand that in Christ is found liberty, and specifically in the resurrection in Christ. And that is where we find freedom. And we see people today that are recognizing, hey, our liberties are being taken away. And, and, and let, me, let me say this too on that subject, and I'm sure I'll hit on it a few times. The whole reason why this isn't on my mind right now, and this sermon was preached, and I realize this in the Bible, is because of what's going on. But what this shows that the government, when they took over so easily, it shows that you didn't have as much freedom and as much, as much liberty as you thought that you had anyways. For them just to flip a switch. You think, let me ask you this question. You think they could have done that, the government that is, they could have done that in 1810, just 40 years after? While the, you know, the founding fathers, the, 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 you know, the, the, the kings, if you will, the princes of liberty, those were still alive who signed all of the founding documents and everything. Do you think that they could have done that? Why? Because they had real liberty. So you know what that tells you? 
We've moved so far. Hey, we may still, we may still have daily been practicing and exercising the liberties that we cannot practice today because of the lockdown shutdown, right? We may have still been practicing those prior to the lockdown and shutdown, but it just shows in so many other areas, liberties have been stripped away so much that you didn't have near as much liberty and freedom as you thought that you had for them to be able to just step in and say, hey, go home, stay home, and if you come out, you better bring your papers with you, right? So, uh, all these people are recognizing this, and <coughs> a lot of them are libertarians, right, that, that stand for freedom. But there's a lot of libertarians that are atheists. I don't know if you've noticed that. There's a ton of libertarians that are atheists, and I believe that they're drawn to this idea because that they think that it's something along the lines of anarchy. You know what I mean? That they, they have this rebellious spirit, and that's what draws them to the idea of liberty, because they, they want to take advantage of their liberty. And they, and, and, and they, they will you know, tout themselves as freedom lovers, and we're, we, we, we love liberty. But let me tell you this, they don't understand true liberty. Atheists and those that haven't experienced you know, the power of the gospel, true liberty and true freedom, they have no idea what true liberty and true freedom is. They may think that they love liberty. They may think that they love freedom. But I'm telling you that pure liberty and pure freedom is found in the gospel. It's found in the resurrection. It's found in Jesus Christ. And if you have not been born again, that's true life and liberty right there, then you're not going to ever understand this. So, so if you want true liberty, if you want true freedom, you have to come to Christ. That's how you have to you know, receive that. But look here at Hebrews chapter number 2. And as I said, I'm going to be, <coughs> this is going to be a, a doctrinally themed sermon this morning. And the very first thing that I want to uh, uh, get to, actually let's read these couple of passages here. Look at this here in uh, Hebrews chapter number 2. Uh, uh, and then I'll, I'll give you the the first point, the answer, uh, or the question, the first question I'm going to be answering. Sorry, look at Hebrews chapter number 2. I want you to look with me at verse number 14. It says this, For as much then as the children are partakers in fle of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. The very first thing that I want to answer for you this morning, first question is this, that if we have freedom and if we have liberty, then that must mean that we are in bondage. That must mean that we <coughs> are, were or were in bondage. Let me word it that way. If you have been set free, if you have been given liberty and there is liberty in the resurrection, you've been given freedom. Well, that means that you must have been in, been in bondage. And I want to answer the question of who were you in bondage to? And the answer is loosely this, sin, death, and the devil. Look at verse number 14 one more time, the very end. It says this, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I want you to notice that it says that through the fear of death, they were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I don't care, again, on the same note, whether you're an atheist, whether you say you don't believe in God or whatever, everyone has a fear of death. Every single person is afraid of dying. But you know what you find in Christ at the moment that you receive the gospel? You find relief and a burden that is lifted off of your shoulder that answers the biggest question in the universe and the scariest thing that we worry about. Where am I going to go when I die? And that is where you find true freedom and true liberty in the resurrection of Christ. Amen. Who we are in a, a, a bondage to is the devil, sin, and death. Romans chapter 18 verse 15 says this, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Notice how that bondage is related again to fear. Do you know why? Because bondage has to do with oppression. People that, are, people that are servants and they are slaves, they live a life of fear because they live a life of no stability. They live a life where they're worried, they're being beaten, they're being mistreated, and they have a wage to pay. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 verse number 26 says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who who are taken captive by him at his will. Notice captivity. What is captivity? It's bondage. It's slavery. And they're taken captive by the devil. The devil is the one that has that power. Romans chapter number 6, verse number 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. 
What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. <clears throat> Excuse me. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Verse 17 says this. But God be thanked, ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, and so forth and so forth. So notice what it said. Ye were the servants of sin. So you know who you were in bondage to? The devil. Do you know who you were in bondage to? You were in bondage to the fear of death. You were in bondage to death itself and sin. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6 verse 23 and you'll see this further. So I was reading there from Romans, but I want you to notice how it concludes. So it's, it's on the topic and teaching about uh, servitude and bondage and being a slave to the devil and being a slave to sin, being in bondage to death and the fear of death. <clears throat> And notice how it concludes in Romans 6, look at verse 23, a very famous verse. For the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> we, have, we have lost touch with this idea of how these two things relate, but truly debt, debt that is, not death, debt, it, and, or wages that you owe to someone is bondage. And it is slavery and it is servitude. Proverbs 22 verse 7 says this, The rich ruleth over the poor, and then it says, And the borrower is servant to the lender. So I want you to notice that the borrower, if you borrow money from someone, so you owe that person money or there's a debt that, that you have to that person, you are now a servant to that person, to the lender. You are a servant to them because you owe them what? Wages or you owe them money. That's why people refer to it as <clears throat> financial freedom. And I'm sure everyone in here could say the same thing, that they felt a similar feeling of relief or a burden's being lifted when you pay off debt. Credit card debt. When you're able to just pay tons of it off, do you know what you feel? You feel burdens being lifted. Obviously, it's not near as extreme as the moment of salvation when you have the debt of death being lifted off your shoulders, right? But it's still, you can still feel a feeling of freedom at that moment. You know why? Because intrinsically, you knew and naturally, you knew that you were subject to that person. And you owed that person money and they could tell you, hey, I need my money at any moment. Hey, go do this. Hey, go do that. You were in subjection to that person. Now, we don't understand this because we have this just destroyed system of, of finances where people, and it's not, it's an unrighteous system where you can just not pay people back. You can just, you know, file for bankruptcy and things along this line, which is unrighteous. The Bible doesn't teach anything like that. Do you know what the Bible teaches? And this actually goes hand in hand with that, that if you go into debt to someone and you are no longer able to pay them back and you have no money, what you can do is you can actually go and serve that person. You can actually go and, and work that debt off as they slave because you were basically already a servant to that person. If you had to borrow money from them, they could come and say, hey, give me my money or hey, do this, hey, do that. They have one up on you, right? That's why people are like, hey, I don't want to borrow money from my in-laws or I don't want to borrow money from this person. Why? Because they'll get one up on you, right? Now they can just, you feel like they can just tell you whatever because they become your boss in a sense, don't they? So notice how it says here, we can see that being taught, the borrower is servant to the lender. Basically what took place, and this can be likened unto, and what's being described there, of what happened with the devil and how he deceived us. Now, there's a snare there. And you sin, and what happens is now, <coughs> now because of that sin that you committed, that was basically the, mo the money that you borrowed, now you're in debt. Now you're in debt for the wages of sin is death. And you know who your master is? It's basically the devil, and he's got a whip which the whip is sin. That's the whip that he has in his hands. He's the taskmaster and he's whipping you with this whip and then the, the stripes on your back, you can refer to that as the consequences. That's death. For the wages of sin is death. It's like an unto debt in Romans 4. I don't know if you've ever put these things together before. But Romans 4.4 4 says, Now to him that worketh is a reward, not reckoned of grace, but of debt. That's talking about you owing the wages of sin is death. You know why? Because now the devil has the power over you. He's the one that is your boss. He, you are now enslaved to him and you have no freedom. And he's, and he's an oppressor. I want you to turn now to Isaiah chapter number 61, verse number 1. It's, it's kind of the concept of like having 
a crooked, a crooked salesman, and he's a he has this deal that he makes with you. But there's you know all these you know hidden things in there, and you know the fine print that you didn't read, but he gets you to sign, right? He he, he tricks you into signing, you know, on the dotted line, and he manipulates you, or you shake on it, right? And people will talk about it. I just sell my freedom to you. You've heard people talk about that. Am I am I have I just now given my freedom away? Have I sold my soul to the devil? It's the same concept. Notice how you may overlook these concepts, but it's, the, it's teaching the exact same thing of how you, become in, you come into subjection to this person. Now you owe that person wages and you have to go work them off, right? The work that you have to pay would be you know, uh, an eternity in hell, would be an eternity in the flames of, of the fires of hell. Uh, that is the wages, it's a consequence and it's a punishment and you are always worried about your sin and the punishment of it. We naturally understand that I have to pay that debt some way or another. And that puts you into this fear, into this bondage of death and being afraid of it because you know that that is your consequence and that is your punishment. Now I want to answer the question is, what sets us free? So we saw who are we in bondage to? If there's freedom that's given at the resurrection, who are we in bondage to? Sin, the devil, and death. That's who we're in bondage to. But what is it that sets us free? What is it specifically that sets us free? So uh, you should have turned to Isaiah chapter number 61. I forgot to paste that verse here, so I have to turn there myself. Isaiah chapter number 61, I want you to look at verse number 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me <coughs> because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings. Now in the New Testament, that says gospel right there. Good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Now watch this. <coughs> To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Notice two different times there when he's talking about preaching the gospel, he says this. He words it and he explains it in this way. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. What is a captive again? It's a prisoner. It's someone that is in bondage and it says that he's going to proclaim liberty to those captives or to those prisoners. And then <coughs> he uses the word prisoner again. He actually says, and the opening of the prison, I'm sorry, he says prison, not prisoner, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. What are they? They're in bondage. And it's an opening of the prison. That's what the message of the gospel is. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 and 19, it says, For Christ also has suffered for sins, hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the, unto the spirits in prison. That's talking about him preaching the gospel when he was on this earth, preaching the gospel to them that are, in, that are bound. You know what he's doing? He was proclaiming liberty. And you may not think of it this way, but when we go out knocking on doors, when we go out soul winning and preaching the gospel, the message that we are giving is a message of liberty. It is a message of freedom. And what you're doing is you're going to the doors of people that are bound by sin. They are bound by the fear of death. They are bound by the devil. The devil has the power over them and they have a wage and a debt that they must pay at one moment and you're going to their door and you're knocking on their door and you're proclaiming liberty to these people. You are bringing freedom and liberty to them. If you were able to put on a pair of spiritual glasses, when they opened up the door, you would see spiritual chains. You would see spiritual fetters around their wrists. They may not understand it, but they know deep in their heart that they have a fear of death. They know deep in their heart that they have a debt that they must pay for the, for the sins that they have committed. Right. You know what you're doing? You're coming to their door and you're saying, Hey, let me tell you how you can be set free from your sins. Let me tell you how you can be given liberty. Let me show you and tell you how you can be given truth true freedom. Amen. There is true freedom found in the gospel. And you know when you're going through the death of Christ, hey, it's touching. Hey, I love the death of Christ. It's amazing. It's powerful. But do you know where the real power when you're giving the gospel is, is, is laid? That he rose again from the dead. That he wasn't bound in hell. That he wasn't bound. His body wasn't left in that tomb. And when you look at his death, everything about it symbolizes bondage. He's, there's the prison the, uh, uh, bars are actually bars of hell. That, that expression is used multiple times in the Bible. The bars of hell. It's used at least three times, I believe. The bars of hell. Uh, there's a key of hell <coughs> to hell and death that Jesus Christ got. Right? There is, uh, there's multiple times where hell is likened unto a prison and to, and to things like that. It talks about Satan being bound in hell. 
right? So while he was dead, he was still in bond. He was taking our payment. He was in bondage. Yes, thank God for it, but do you know where the real liberty was? When he was set free and he had the key. When he rose again from the dead and he stepped out of the grave. Think about his body. His body was sealed in a tomb with a big rock that had been rolled in front of it. That's bondage. And he's just stuck in there. Not only that, furthermore, he had uh, uh, watchmen standing there. Do you know where those watchmen normally are at? A prison. And they brought in these people to watch his, his uh, tomb. What does it all symbolize? It, all of that you know, looks like and perceives like bondage and slavery and being in a prison. Right? The exact opposite of freedom. But do you know where there was, when there was liberty? When he rose from the dead. When he, when he walked out of the tomb, that's where there was true liberty and true freedom. And when you're preaching the gospel to people, do you know where they start realizing that liberty and that freedom? When it's when they realize that Christ had that liberty and that freedom. And you know where we find it? In Christ. Because he defeated death and paid our punishment and rose from the dead and received liberty and freedom that, uh, himself. You know where we find it? In Him. And they start understanding that and recognizing that and they say, that's what I want. I want that liberty. I want that freedom. I want my debt to be paid and I want to be, I want to raise again from the dead as well and be set free from my bondage. Amen. So when we go door to door, do you know what you're really bringing? And maybe we haven't noticed this to its, to its full extent is you are going and you are proclaiming liberty to people that are enslaved. You are going to people's doors and you are preaching true freedom to them. They think, oh, I've lost my freedoms here. You have no idea how in debt and how enslaved you truly are. You're in, you know, if you think that you're in bondage being on lockdown, you know, being able to watch TV and, and, and you know, get on the internet, surf the internet, you have no clue spiritually how, in, uh, you know, how much in bondage you really are. You are in bondage a lot more than you think, buddy. And that's something we <coughs> truly need to be worried about. We are preaching a message of liberty and a message of freedom. Go to John chapter number 8. Who is it that set us free? Who is it that gives us liberty and gives us freedom? <clears throat> you know, here in the United States of America, you know, we are not, as I said, near as free today as we think we are and as many think we are. But... You know, we still do have many freedoms, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for my right to practice my religion. I'm thankful for my right of free speech, you know, where it is not infringed, at least, because it is in some areas. I'm thankful for all of that. And the person that, not just an individual, but the people that gave us that, we know some of their names, right? We know some of the people that fought for those rights, and there were individuals and real people and persons that fought to give liberty to those that would live afterwards, right? Their, their you, know, uh, uh, you know, posterity that would come and live in this country and in this nation, in this nation. George Washington. Of course, he's the first president. He was the captain when they were fighting, right, of, of the, uh, in the war, the Revolutionary War. He was the captain uh, for, the, for that which would be United States of America later. We, we know uh, of uh, Thomas Jefferson, who actually wrote up the Constitution, right? He's the one who put the pen to the page and, and was the author of the Constitution itself. I'm sure there's other brains that were involved in that. We know some of these people. They, they, those are the people who gave us liberty in the sense of our freedoms and our liberty here in the United States of America. But who gives us true freedom and true liberty? The, the, the freedom of our, of our souls, the freedom of our spirits. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter number 8, verse number 31. <clears throat> Look at verse 30. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now skip down to verse 36. It says this. <clears throat> if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The person that gives us true liberty and true freedom that cannot be found in any country under any governance or, or government is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives real freedom and real liberty. I want you to look also what it says just prior to that. <coughs> I want to skip back up. Notice what it says in verse 33 when the Jews responded. They said, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou ye shall be made free? So they're totally oblivious. Like, hey, we're not in bondage. I'm not, you know, I don't have a, a, a slave a master. 
Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever. But then he says this, But the Son abideth forever. Notice again, it's the Son that gives you freedom. And you know the difference between the freedoms that we have in the United States of America and the freedom that is a heavenly freedom, that is a freedom of New Jerusalem and a freedom of, of the true Mount Zion, is that the freedoms that you receive in Christ are eternal freedoms. Yeah. That is a liberty that you will retain forever. Let me guarantee you this, that the United States of America, no matter what happens, and I don't know what's going to take place now, this could be the end, maybe it's not, but I can guarantee you this, that if the United States of America does continue as a nation for a hundred years or so, the liberties will ultimately be lost. The freedoms that the people have in this nation today, there is no country that has continued with true freedom and strong freedom like, you know, it, it, it's never existed. The nation of United States of America will eventually lose its freedom some way or another. I don't know how it happens. If it's during the Antichrist and end times, so they lose it to the Antichrist. It's not an eternal freedom. It is a temporary freedom. It is a temporary liberty and it will not last forever. But guess what? When the sun's there and the sun gives liberty, he abides forever. It's a freedom and a liberty that you will have forever and it will always be with you. And you know what that's talking about? Here's, you know, these three are one. You know, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. When He comes and he, he abides in the house, the house is your body. There's a, there's a deeper truth here, to be specific. The house is your body, the temple, right? Over and over again, it's called that. And when the Son comes in, He abides forever. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Once you receive your freedom and your liberty through the Spirit of Christ, you will retain that forever. And this idea is also taught in some passages where it talks about being redeemed. And it talks about the Spirit of the Lord, how we're redeemed, and that is the earnest of our inheritance and how we're redeemed. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means that you're given freedom. You know, it talks about them proclaiming liberty and that slaves are even set, set free, you know, at the proclamation <coughs> of liberty in the, uh, the feast that they celebrated. People would be set free. They would be let loose of their bondage. Men would be receiving their property back. They were, they, they, all the debts were released. Notice again, the wages, the debt, the yoke, all of that being entangled in one, right? And they were given freedom. We were given freedom. The Son is the one that gives true freedom. He's the one that redeemed us from the power of death. We were enslaved to death, uh, to death and to the devil and to sin. And there was a cost that had to be paid. And we were, we were basically in bondage. And the Lord Jesus Christ came and He paid that debt and redeemed us and took us back with Him and we'll be with Him forever. Amen. And He'll never leave us and He'll never forsake us. And this beautiful truth is taught, you can see this with, with Ruth and Boaz as well. You know, Boaz basically comes and he redeems her. He pays that debt and then she goes with him. And that's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ redeeming the church and paying for the church. So this is the proclamation of liberty. True liberty is found in the Son. That is who gives us true liberty and it's eternal liberty. Hey, if you're a freedom lover, if you love freedom and you love liberty... Well, then you should love the Lord Jesus Christ because He gives eternal freedoms Amen. and eternal liberty that will never be taken away. I want you to turn with me now, please, to... I want you to go to Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. <coughs> Read you a few verses about the power of the resurrection and showing you that that is where true pa the true power lies. Romans 1, 4 says, "...and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead." So how did He declare and where was the power? It was, it was in the resurrection. That's where He declared to be the Son of God with power. Philippians 3, 10 says this, "...that I may know Him." And then it says, "...and the power of His resurrection." That is where the power lies. <clears throat> Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, it shows that He raised from the dead and that that was Him being loosed from our bondage. He's paying our debt and the wages that we owed. He was redeeming us and He, was, uh, he received liberty when He went out so that we, He could give us that same liberty in Christ. Revelation 1.18 says, I am He that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. 
That's him relating that to the resurrection. That's why he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. He's saying, I was dead, but I rose again from the dead. He's referring to his resurrection, and that's why he mentions the fact that he has the keys of hell and of death. In order to have the keys and him not to be there any longer, that means that he rose again from the dead. That's where the power lies, is that he has the keys. When you think about that, it's an amazing thought that... <clears throat> of the analogy, and it's true, it's just a spiritual truth that when we go to the door, we're basically bringing freedom to a person that is in bondage. And we are, we are a mediator in between the Son. The Son is the one that gives true freedom and true liberty. And we go to their door and we proclaim the message of liberty. We tell them how they can be set free and how this man has redeemed them and he's paid their debt. And all you have to do is you have to take the key of faith. And you just take that key of faith when you call upon the name of the Lord at that moment, you're sticking that key in that fetter and it's broken. You know what that moment is? That's the moment that you experience, the moment that I experienced when those burdens were lifted. It was the spiritual chains literally just falling off of my arms, Amen. just falling off of my shoulders. And it's true relief that you find. And it's an amazing truth that when you really think about that, that you're going to the door. You say, oh, you know, people try to attack you know, uh, uh, you know, soul winning and, and you know, nowadays nobody wants to have the true method of going door to door. That's the most loving message that you could possibly bring to someone. Someone that's bound by the power of the devil and to sin and death and you're going to their door and you're trying to tell them, hey, let me show you true liberty and true freedom. Let me show you how you can be set free from your fear of death and from the bondage and the debt that you're going to have to pay when you die. It's true freedom. It's true liberty. There is no greater freedom and no greater liberty. The, the, the freedoms of the United States of America, I thank God for them. I thank God that I was born in the United States of America. You know, this nation is a, is a wicked nation in a lot of ways. But I am thankful for the freedoms that I'm given and for, you know, the, uh, the, the presence of Christianity. However much it is, I, I'm thankful for that. But that is nothing compared to the liberty and the freedom that's found in heaven and in the Lord Jesus Christ and specifically in the resurrection. Acts chapter 2 verse 24 says, Whom God hath raised up, having loosed, notice that, loosed the pains of death. And then it says this, and I love this verse. It just shows the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, how powerful it is. It says, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Notice that, how it just throws that little phrase in there. God raised him up, and that it, it, the, the, having loosed the pains of death, and then it says, because it was not possible that he should have been holding of it. He's so powerful, they couldn't have kept him there anyways. He couldn't have stayed there anyways because of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not possible that, that, that he could have stayed there because of his power. So, <clears throat> true liberty, true freedom is found in the resurrection. And there are different things that come with liberty and freedom just in general. The, 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 just the concept of freedom, it carries, and the principle of freedom, it carries some benefits. The resurrection and the freedom found therein gives us hope, right? Freedom gives you hope. I can go out and I can do things, right? You have hope there. there it's, you're, you're, when you're in bondage, there's no hope. You can't do anything, right? There's no hope there. Uh, uh, the resurrection and freedom in general, it gives life. That's why I say, every man has the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's basically being restated there. What do they mean by life? Liberty, to live your life, right? The ability to be here and to live, right? To be given the liberty of life. What does the freedom of the resurrection give? That's where you're given life. That's where life is found. I want you to notice that, that when it says the spirit of the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty... That has a very deep meaning of where there's freedom there. Death is bondage. But you know what rose Jesus from the dead, raised him from the dead, was the Spirit of the Lord, right? Received, he received the, uh, uh, life in his body, which was the Spirit of God, and he rose again from the dead. The resurrection gives us peace. Freedom gives you peace. When you have true freedom, you have peace. You don't have to worry about anything. But when you have an oppressor, when you have a, 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 a master or a taskmaster... There's no peace there. You're always worried and concerned. You're grieved. Like the children of Israel when they were in bondage. They were grieved. They had no peace. But you know what they got? They received liberty and freedom when they entered into the land of promise. It was peace there. It was a land of peace. Why? Because they were given. And that's a picture of them being redeemed in salvation and being brought you know, to heaven. Uh, but also, and I want to end with this. This is going to be the practical point that we need to walk away with. But also with liberty comes responsibility. And that is so true. With liberty, when you are given freedom and you are given liberty, 
There comes responsibility. You must take responsibility for yourself. You must take accountability for yourself. And let me say this, you must govern yourself. You need to govern yourself. Brother Rick brought this up at the end of you know, uh, last week's sermon of the, the, the idea of <coughs> if a nation does not govern itself, the government will govern them. If you do not govern yourself, somebody else is going to govern you. With liberty comes the ability, though, to, to govern yourself. When you have freedom, you know what you need to do? You need to govern yourself. That's why the more sinful the United States of America became, the more the federal government came in and restrained and limited their freedoms and their abilities. Because we weren't able to take care of ourselves and people are just, you know, that's why atheism doesn't mix with, with true liberty and true freedom. You don't understand. You're going to have a, a taskmaster, buddy. If you put a bunch of atheists in, in, in the country of the United States of America when there was true liberty here, they would have went downhill way faster. Way faster and they would have lost their liberties because the government would have stepped in and said, hey, we, you know, it's kind of like the idea of like what was going on in the Wild West. There were, I don't know if you know about this, but when the Wild West was taking place, you know, the federal government stepped in multiple times and there were a lot of people that didn't like that because they, they were freedom lovers and liberty lovers. I don't know if you know that, but the federal government like came in down into Arizona and Tombstone multiple times and they were like passing new laws and writing executive orders just because things in the Wild West got, that's why it's called the Wild West, they got really out of control with gunfights constantly, people dying, just battles constantly. It was a bloodbath out in the West. It was a, a total bloodbath. And the federal government stepped in. Do you know why? Because they weren't governing, governing themselves. Because they weren't governing themselves. Because with liberty, there comes accountability and responsibility. You know, it's the same concept with, you know, I remember Ron Paul when he was in the debate uh, 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 for Republicans, you know, the, the actual Republican debate that they had in one of the conventions. I remember one of the questions they asked him was like, <clears throat> So you don't believe in uh, the idea of you know, you know, forcing people to have insurance, that somebody has to have insurance either way? They were already pushing like mandatory insurance, even on a Republican platform stage. You know, and supposedly Republicans believe in freedom. But they're like, they're, they're like uh, questioning him and trying to, they're trying to make him look bad like they always did. Of like, so you don't believe in you know, mandatory uh, uh, insurance for, for all? And, that, you know, and, and then he like paints this scenario. What about this guy? He's 24 years old. He chooses not to have you know, insurance. He's out riding a motorcycle <coughs> and he wrecks the motorcycle and he's in a coma and you know, he's taken to the hospital. Should we just let him die? That, you know, say paint the scenario just to, like try to pit you know, you know, everybody against him. It's, it's, it's obviously not a fair scenario at all in the first place. Uh, and you know, Ron Paul answered and was like, you know, number one, he, that would never happen anyway. He would not die. You know, any, there's never been a situation where someone has went into a coma or something, you take them to a the hospital, people take care of you know, them. No matter what, they're going to take care of them. Charity organizations pay for things like that. I, you know, and that's what he said, and I believe the same thing, that the private businesses will step in. There was some church, I showed this to my wife, that literally, they, they just, based, it was just the church and the offerings and the tithes and the charity offerings that came in, they paid, like, I can't even remember how much it was. It was like hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars of back debt that people had in the United States of America for the, uh, medical bills. And it was like 48 million people totally out of debt. And you expect me to believe that one guy in a coma gets brought in here and they're just going to put him outside and let him die? Get real. It's a stupid scenario in the first place. But you know what Ron Paul said was, when the, with liberty comes responsibility. So either you take away the man's liberty and force him to pay for something that he doesn't want and force something upon them that he doesn't want in his life and I don't want my money to go to that. I want my money to go here. Or you give him the responsibility and then he has the consequences later. Right? Not to say that he would die because people would take care of him. But there, with that comes responsibility. And if you make bad decisions, guess what comes? Consequences. So with liberty comes great responsibility. And we have great liberty in Christ. Another way in which that we have liberty, and it's all tied together with the resurrection, everything. So when we're raised with Christ, we're raised in that liberty. And with that 
cleansed soul of salvation with grace where we can never lose our salvation. I'm already risen from the dead when you're looking at me up here. My body might not be, but my soul is in heaven with Christ. Amen. I'm already saved and sealed. I can never go to hell. My, my debt is paid. He knew how much debt I was going to rack up, and he said, hey, let me just go ahead and pay all of it right now. Right. I couldn't go to hell. It's not possible. There's nothing I could do. So my soul is already risen with Christ. So you know what I have? I have liberty to rack up more debt because he already paid out how much it's going to be. I have liberty just to go out and to do whatever I want. We have that liberty in Christ. You know, it tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16, as free. But then it says this. And not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of Christ. So notice what it says, as free, because you are free. But then he says this, but not using your liberty, not using your liberty as a cloak of maliciousness. But notice what you could do. You could take advantage of your liberty. You could use your liberty in a way in which you should not. But then he says this, but as the servants of Christ. Notice that this would be of your own volition. <coughs> This would be of your own will, that you would be deciding to serve Christ with your life. You would be deciding that, hey, I want to be a servant of God. I want to be a servant of Christ. Galatians 5.13 teaches the same thing. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. But then it says this, only use not, notice that word again, use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. The only way that that verse makes sense is that you could use that liberty for an occasion of the flesh. Just to sin because I want to. Just because I enjoy it, I'm just going to, because I have the liberty, I'm just going to use it just for this occasion, just so that I could sin and do what I want. People mock and ridicule this idea, but it's so clearly taught in the Bible. That's actually what Romans chapter number 6 is talking about. Did you turn to Romans 6? Look at Romans chapter number 6. The whole chapter of Romans chapter number 6 is describing this idea. And I want to paint this in your mind because what is so great about the moment of salvation is the power that lies in the gospel. And what is so great about the gospel is the power that lies in the resurrection. And what is so great about the resurrection is the freedom that's found in the resurrection. And I want, I want you to understand that what took place at the moment that you got saved was this. The devil was your taskmaster and he had a whip and that whip was sin and he was hitting you with that whip and you were receiving the wages of sin. You know what it was? It was death. And you're dying, you know, uh, of course where you're gonna die in this world and then you're gonna receive the, the latter punishment of the soul of death and hell. But Jesus came and he paid your punishment for you. He took the whip he, uh, you know, the, 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 the scourgings that you deserve and the wages that you deserve upon his own back. He paid what your wages were. He redeemed you with money and paid that wage so that you could be set free. And we go and we proclaim that message of liberty, which is the gospel from door to door. And those people are spiritually bound in those chains. And all they have to do, and we say, hey, the son paid your debt. The son, you know, he, off, he, he, he created a way for you to receive liberty and he wants to redeem you. And all you have to do is take that key of faith and stick it into the keyhole in the bands and just turn it. And you know the way you do that? You call upon the name of the Lord by faith and you receive at that moment freedom and liberty. And the chains fall and right then you have that moment of a burden being lifted. That burden is those chains, the fear of death and the fear of, you know, sin and the punishments therein. But at, when you are set free, do you know what you could do? You have true freedom, real freedom, just like they had in 1776. You could go do whatever you want. You're set free, you could go do whatever you want. You could spend the rest of your life serving that same master, even if you wanted to. You could spend the rest of your life, you could go straight back to that oppressive bond servant or bond, bond man, bond master, taskmaster. That is the devil. And just allow him. Just Because you know what it is? Is There's a certain thing that you like to do in the house of that master. There's whatever sin that it is that's your vice and your niche. That's why I call it a vice because it's bondage. It clamps down on you. Whatever it is that you enjoy, there's a certain sin that you like and it's located in that master's house. And you, if you want, you can go back in his house and do that sin. But when you do it, there's a wage that comes with it. Obviously, you're not going to go to hell anymore. You receive that, you know, the punishment from the Lord. 
on this earth. And you would still receive that punishment. But you can go in there and you can enjoy that until you die. And you'll receive the wages of that in the flesh. If you reap, you know, if you sow to the flesh, you'll receive it in the flesh. Or you could choose because your soul has been set free. You could choose because you were given freedom and liberty from that. Because now you won't have to pay that punishment when you die for an eternity in hell and you'll be given eternal freedom and true freedom in heaven. You could choose out of a grateful heart to go and to spend your life serving the Lord Jesus Christ who paid your debt for you and paid all of your wages, whatever it was, and paid all of your sins out of thankfulness you could go to Him and say, hey, I'd like to serve you with the rest of my life on this earth because what you have done for me in giving me the liberty and not having to pay my own punishment. Look at Romans chapter number 6 and that's exactly what this is teaching here. <clears throat> what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now that question can only be asked if you could continue in sin and grace would abound. So he's saying what shall we say then? Because grace would abound, shall we continue in sin because it will abound? And then he answers, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Now watch this. What's the whole reason why we die? That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, notice how the emphasis is always on the resurrection. We shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with Him. Notice the life that's given with the liberty. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Notice the bondage is loose totally. And then it says this, Death, watch this, hath no more dominion over him. Notice what it said? Speaking in the context about your liberty, about being in, what it means to be in grace. It's the freedom. It's the liberty in Christ. That we've been given liberty by the resurrection. It's a done deal. And we're saved and we're sealed in Christ. And because of that, should we continue in sin? What's it asking? It's asking the same question. As free and not using our liberty for the cloak of maliciousness. And then just like it said in Galatians 5.13, You have been called unto liberty, only use not your liberty for, the, for an occasion to the flesh. You know what it's saying? Because you have been given freedom and life, because you're already risen with Christ and it's already a done deal, your bondage has already been, you know, you've been set free. Should you continue in sin? That grace may abound? You know what the answer is? God forbid. God forbid. The greatest thing about the gospel is the resurrection. The greatest thing about the resurrection is the freedom of the resurrection. Amen. And you know what we should do because of the liberties and the freedoms that we have? That should cause you to be thankful. It's far greater and far more precious. Hey, I, I'm thankful and I cherish the freedom that I have from the United States of America. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm thankful that I can serve the Lord without persecution and molestation all the time. That's a good thing. But you know what? I'm a heck of a lot more thankful for the liberty and the freedom that I found in Christ Amen. and that I have as a citizen of Israel, true Israel Amen. and true Jerusalem which is above. And because of that liberty and that freedom that I've been given, I'm going to choose to serve Christ as my master for what he's done for me. And obviously you could never pay it back, but you know what? out of a grateful and thankful heart, you could spend your time showing your appreciativeness of what He has done for you. There's no greater liberty, and there's no greater freedom that's found in the resurrection. And we think about the resurrection, we think about Easter all the time. And uh, every year it comes and somebody preaches a sermon about, you know, uh, the resurrection and Easter. And that's what Easter is. It's, the, it's another word for the Passover. At the end of the Passover, He rose from the dead. And one thing that, that, that I feel like I've missed, and you've probably missed as well, that why the resurrection is so great is because that there is freedom in the resurrection. And that moment of your burdens being lifted, that's you being risen from the dead in Christ. That's you being raised. That old man is buried and dead and he's gone, and the sins and the wages that he needed to pay, they're gone. 
And you know what you did was you rose from the dead. And you know what else you received? You received life. You were redeemed and you received the Spirit of God that came and dwelled in your hearts and He set you free. The Son set you free and He'll abide there forever. It's an eternal liberty and an eternal freedom. Appreciate your eternal liberty and your eternal freedom that's found in the resurrection. And because of that, show God and serve Him as your master. Amen. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. To Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for the resurrection. We, we thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. We thank you so much for everything that you've done for us in our lives. Uh, we thank you for paying our debt. Uh, help us out of an appreciative and thankful heart, dear God. Help us to, to uh, spend our time serving you and willingly serve you. We're thankful that you gave us liberty and that you didn't force us, but you gave us free will and of our own volition. That you loved us so much, you paid all the debt and you just gave it, gave it to us graciously. Uh, we thank you so much, dear Lord. Just be with us and bless us. Help us to dwell upon the resurrection. Help us to dwell upon the gospel and understand that there is liberty found therein. And that the liberty that's in the Bible, the liberty that's found in God and in Christ, is a freedom and a liberty that cannot be compared unto. Help us to cherish that liberty and that freedom. Help us to set our eyes. While our liberties are diminishing here in the U.S., Help that to just cause us to be you know, more thankful and more grateful for the liberties that we have in you and we might serve you better. We love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.